Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Welcome to this British episode of the Genealogy Gems Podcast. This is episode 52, and I'm excited about this episode because it's all about British research. And I know that many of you have written and told me that you have British ancestors and would love some tips and inspiration on the subject, and I'm happy to oblige. Now, personally, I don't have any ancestors, at least that I know of, uh, from the British Isles, so I kind of live vicariously through my husband's family tree, which is steeped in British ancestors. And this year, I hit the jackpot when I was able to track down one of his long-lost cousins who had a treasure trove of family history tucked away in the rafters of her garage. In an old tattered box, we found the first known photographs taken in England of his grandfather as a child and his great-grandfather and mother. Very exciting stuff. In fact, um, that's what prompted a premium episode that was all about how to tap into your inner private eye to find those long-lost living relatives, because they can be such a fantastic resource. But of course, in today's world, with so much uh, concern about identity security, it can be a really tough task to uh, track living relatives down. So of course, I was just uh, thrilled to find her. Well, I was really fortunate to track down um, several British genealogy experts while I was at the FGS conference in Philadelphia last month uh, because I wanted to bring you some of their wisdom and experience on the subject. So we'll let Albert Farrington and Chorus from 1914 lead us into our first British gem, uh, my conversation with lecturer and author Rick Croom with those familiar strains of Rural Britannia. with Rick Kroom at the FGS conference in Philadelphia in 2008, and um, I wanted to pull him aside and find out a little bit about what you've been talking about here at the conference, because um, we 
I have such a personal interest in British records, and I know a lot of my listeners do, so tell me a little bit about the um, presentations that you've been giving. Yesterday I gave a presentation on researching your British ancestry online, so I focused especially on records that you can access over the Internet, especially census records and birth, marriage, and death indexes. And later today I'm giving a presentation on researching your ancestry in Wales. Um, it's actually a case study showing how I trace my family back from Pennsylvania to where they lived in Wales. And one of the um, neat things about um, being at a conference and let's say you're in the audience listening to a presentation of this sort, I cite a number of online services that you can subscribe to and resources available from the British National Archives. And it just turns out that if you um, head over to the exhibit area at this conference, you'll see um, an exhibit from the British National Archives. So um, if you have questions from my presentation on what's available from the British National Archives, you can head right over there and ask them. They're here from London. Or if you have, let's say, questions on, uh, on a service called findmypast.com, this is a British subscription service, guess what? They're exhibiting here too, so you can just walk over to their booth and ask them ab about what kind of online records they offer, how much does it cost. Um, you can find out um, if it fits your needs. So you really have easy access to a lot of important resources all in one place. It's like one-stop shopping, you know, for international research. And that's what I think um, maybe some folks don't realize about some of these conferences. Um, you know, you think, oh, it's probably a lot of, you know, general-type topics because there's a lot of people here. But you can really get in and, and get good information on specific areas. I mean, Wales is a very small country, very specific, and yet many people will find eventually that they may have somebody from Wales. And there are so many classes here that they can actually offer that kind of specific information. That, that's right. There's um, quite a combination of general topics if you're a beginning genealogist or if you're really an advanced one. I just came from a presentation on comparing records, analyzing records, and getting clues. It was really quite a complicated subject that explained how when you hit a brick wall in your research, you can infer conclusions even when a record doesn't explicitly state, let's say, that um, John Jones was a son of Samuel Jones. And so um, there's quite a range of topics and even a lot of quite esoteric topics on kind of obscure subjects that you know, just could be what you're looking for. And there's a, a not only um, presentations on British genealogy, but um, German genealogy, um, Pennsylvania genealogy, of course, researching in other areas of the U.S. Presentations cover a lot of different subject areas like military records, and you name it, there's a lot to choose from. And, and like you say, you, you walk out of the class, you head down to the exhibit hall, and there's just such a wide variety of vendors. And, and I was surprised that there were the folks from England who'd come over. It's a long trip, and yet um, how fantastic to get a chance to meet them face-to-face -face and ask those questions you've been wanting to ask. Right. And you also um, get to learn about the newest services available, too. I was really surprised in the exhibit area to stumble upon a new service for Irish genealogy. I think it's called Irish Roots, and yeah. they have indexed many of the Irish church records, both Catholic and Protestant records. These are records that until now were not easily accessible at all. And I can see how this resource could be just tremendously useful if you're um, researching your family history in Ireland and maybe you don't have any idea where they lived. And you really mm -hmm. need to identify the locality where your family came from before you can find much more information. But this new online tool um, could help you um, identify the exact place where your family lived in Ireland. And that's something else I've noticed is that a lot of the um, different companies and websites, they oftentimes will launch new items and new products and they'll wait for the major conferences to do that so you know when you come here you're going to be hitting, hearing about it first. Right, that, that's so true. Um, for instance I learned in uh, at the Ancestral Quest booth, this is one of 
Uh, it's a popular genealogy program for organizing your family history. And they've just introduced a new feature in the program that lets the, the genealogy software interface with new family search and new features from this website from the LDS or Mormon church. Uh, so that's um, kind of an exciting development. This is the first program that offers that feature. Oh, how interesting. Well, thank you so much. I was so lucky to pull you aside, and um, I know that we'll be talking about military records on the Family Tree Magazine podcast, so I encourage all my listeners to go over and check that out. But I know you're off to speak, and I'm going to go give a presentation on podcasting, see if we can't get some more genealogists to listen to genealogy podcasts. Okay, that sounds good. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. You too. Thank you. I've got more British gems coming up for you from genealogy lecturer and author Dr. Christopher Watts right after this. Looking for a way to get even more genealogy gems that will power boost your research, inspire your creativity, and give you the motivation you need to tackle that brick wall? Become a Genealogy Gems Premium member and start reaping the benefits right away. And by entering the coupon code SAVE20, you can get 20% off the annual membership. You'll get two extra members-only episodes every month packed with great information you can use right away, an instructional video series walking you through the best Internet tools and family history projects step-by-step. And membership is not only educational, it's fun. You can synergize with other listeners in the message forum and even try your hand at the genealogy-themed crossword puzzles. If you enjoy the Genealogy Gems podcast, then you're going to love being a Genealogy Gems premium member. But don't just take my word for it. Here's what your fellow podcast listeners have to say. I just wanted to take a moment to let you know how much I enjoy your Genealogy Gems premium podcast. They're like frosting on the cake in my quest to research my ancestors. I enjoy the in-depth interviews with your guests and experts and find the videos and forms really useful. Recently, I was one of the winners of your contest to have Paula Sassy analyze my grandmother's handwriting. This information was so exciting. Paula could have been describing my own mother and myself, so no doubt she captured my grandmother's personality. Keep up the good work on the premium podcast, and thanks for being there for us, Lisa. Sue Torgerson. To become a premium member and start reaping the benefits right away, go to genealogygems.tv and click the Join Today button. Be sure and add the special coupon code SAVE20 and you'll get 20% off the annual membership. Genealogy Gems Premium Membership. It's where you belong. Our next British gem is Dr. Christopher Watts a British genealogist who spoke on the topic of British apprenticeship records at the FGS 2008 conference. Now, we're really lucky in our family to have an original blacksmith apprenticeship document. Uh, It's back from 1872 for Bill's great-grandfather, Harry Cook. But there are other ways to get your hands on these unique records that Dr. Watts shares with us. Here's my conversation with him. Well, I'm here with Dr. Christopher T. Watts, and I just sat in on your terrific presentation on British apprenticeship records. Now, English specifically? Because I heard you say to somebody that Scotland wasn't an area that you really focused on. Yes, always a a difficult question talking to uh, Americans, because they tend to think of the whole of uh, uh, Great Britain as England. Um, I did mean specifically England. Uh, not Wales, not Scotland, not Ireland, um, because basically the, the records and the organization of them is significantly different. Right. And I know for me, um, one of the reasons I, I really honed in on your presentation, definitely wanted to be here in person, was because we actually have an apprenticeship record from 1872, which is the original that uh, the blacksmith apprentice oh, great. you know, passed on mm-hmm. through the family. And um, so it was fascinating to hear, one, how widespread apprenticeship records may be. There may be many people out there listening who have British ancestors, um, people from England who they didn't realize may have been apprenticed at some point. 
um, whether to a trade or you mentioned a lot about the sea and maybe tell us a little bit about, we think of blacksmiths and silversmiths, but um, you talked a lot about um, merchant marines or, or different occupations on the sea. Yes, perhaps that uh, reflects my bias and particular interest in, uh, uh, in Merchant Navy records. Uh, just first of all to, to say, of course, uh, until the 20th century, apprenticeship was the way in which a young person normally learnt his trade. Um, seven years, five years, whatever, uh, would be what he would do working alongside a... Uh, an experienced tradesman. <clears throat> now, ship captains would quite happily take on apprentices to the sea. Um, again, um, the merchant navy, you know, a young, uh, young lad wanting to learn how to be a merchant seaman. Um, and he would spend his time uh, doing the sort of more menial things and gradually working his his way up. Um, an exciting way of seeing the world for him and getting away from, well, who knows what at, uh, at home. Um, and of course with merchant seamen, I tend to forget in the British Isles it is impossible to get more than 60 miles away from the sea. And I'm not sure I would do it. In fact, I know I wouldn't. <laughs> but one of my ancestors could do that in a couple of days, a couple of days walking um, to do that. So if some young lad wanted to uh, uh, escape uh, something or see the delights of the world, that was a good way to do it. And it wasn't too far to go. It, it was really almost an option, it sounds like, for about anybody it living was. in England. Uh -huh. Yes, it certainly was an option for, for almost uh, anybody. Obviously, people who lived close to the sea... Uh, then that would be quite the norm. Uh, people who were uh, children and of uh, um, fishermen or small ship owners and so on, or, or who lived in a big port town uh, or city, um, that was a more obvious option. But it was certainly not impossible for anybody from uh, a significant uh, distance away. Well, let's backtrack a little bit and talk about um, the documents themselves. Having an original document myself, I was fascinated about your explanation about where the word indenture comes from and how that literally is tied into that piece of paper. Maybe you could tell our audience a little bit about what, um, what you were talking about in terms of indenture and the documents. Yes, an indenture, if you have a look, you, you're likely to just see one half of an indenture. Uh, it could be in two parts, it could be in three. But let's talk about ones that are in two parts. And what would happen is that the agreement would be written out twice, uh, head to head. So the top of one document uh, abutting the top of the other. So you turn it around through 180 degrees and you could read the same again. So this document that I have is half of a document. Exactly. Okay. That's it. And one half was going to be going to the apprentice, which is, I guess, the one you would have. And the other one would be going to the master or the employer. Now, to make sure there wasn't a, a forgery, uh, when the two parties had looked at it and signed it or uh, agreed it was right, uh, they would quite often they would write across the gap between the two portions the word chirograph. And then they would take a knife for whatever to hand, and cut a wavy line across the, uh, cutting the letters in part. And what would then happen is the two parties would take it away. If there was ever a, a disagreement, they could bring the two back together and make sure it wasn't a forgery. They could put the two parts together. They would match perfectly, and the word caragraph would show up again down the centre. And... Indenture, you were talking about it could literally be the cut between the two papers. Yes, the indentures, they're the, the dent, if the you like. Marks, the marks, yeah. The teeth marks <laughs> between them, yes. Okay. Um, and for some court records, they're in fact in three parts. Uh, so it's very, very rare indeed uh, to find uh, all three and put them back together again. 
Now, I've noticed on the document that I have, there's actually, uh, it almost looks like a, a wax mark, or a, I saw some splotches on the documents that you were showing on the screen. Maybe tell us a little bit about what that uh, affixed symbol meant. Yes, that would, that would be a seal, um, just to effectively give it legal authority. Um, it could take various forms. In modern times, you'll, you'll see quite often just a red sticker with a star, you know, mm -hmm. star-shaped, and it's probably got an embossed uh, um, um, mark made on it by the uh, by the lawyer or attorney or court. Um, that is the modern equivalent of what was done with sealing wax and a little stamp, um, which uh, embossed a some form of symbol uh, in it uh, and that was intended really to give it some form of uh, legal standing. And that got me to wondering about where was, let's say, in 1872, okay, um, my, my husband's great-great-grandfather is being an apprenticed as a blacksmith and his father is there. Um, where would this have occurred? They were in a town in, and I, want to, I hope I'm saying this correctly, Huntingtonshire? Yes, is that Huntington close? Yes, okay. that's, a, that's the county. That's the county. Um, where would that kind of um, deal be struck? It could be struck anywhere, but as likely as not, it's going to be in the market town. Oh. And uh, this would be where the, um, uh, the father of the, uh, the apprentice and the master, the employer, would probably meet up, probably in the local tavern. So okay. uh, um, that was a place where a lot of business uh, was done. A lot of ale drunk as well. But a pint would help the uh, help it go down well for those giving away their children. You know, I mean, to a, you know, for seven years. Indeed, indeed. So, uh, in fact, taverns were uh, quite commonplace, uh, not just for that sort of transaction, but for all sorts of uh, legal meetings and, and, and a coroner's so. inquest or whatever is going on. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you can, in fact, see some uh, accounts submitted by uh, parish constables who'd gone to the uh, local court and how much they ate and drank at the local little tavern and were reclaiming on their expenses. In, in a situation where um, you might have, like, if I have the apprentice document, what other documents would exist? Or let's say you have the master side or that you've gone to uh, the National Archives and you've found one or the other. Are there any other accompanying documents that you should be looking for? In general, no. Okay. Those are the two things. It's an agreement between the master and the uh, um, apprentice's uh, guardian. Um, and uh, that would be all the formality that, uh, that there was. Uh, yes, if there's any tax paid on it, uh, then there would be some records at the, at the National Archives, um, and they cover the period from 1710 to 1811. They're particularly rich from 1710 till about 1754. That's the richest time period. <clears throat> if they were used in uh, a big city, particularly London, in support of uh, gaining the freedom of the city, that's the uh, freedom to trade within the boundaries of the, that particular city, then the, there may be records um, held by uh, the um, city or county archives uh, as well. That could be supporting uh, documents there. But these, in a sense, are periphery to the apprenticeship. Um, I don't mean they're unimportant. They, they are, and... Uh, but you shouldn't necessarily expect to find them in every case. Um, the core to the thing was an agreement between the master and the apprentice's uh, uh, father or guardian, um, and that was the, um, the key. And you mentioned the 1700s, and that was one of the things that really struck me about your, your presentation. These are really old records, and in fact, you talked a little bit about um, how things changed, let's say, after 1811, which, which I wasn't expecting you to be talking more about the 19th century, and really it was much earlier. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, how apprenticeship changed over those centuries. Well, I begin to ask myself the question of, did it change very much? I think the basic core principle hasn't changed. Uh, it was a young lad, or now young girls who were working alongside somebody with experience showing them how to do the job. 
Um, and in earlier times, certainly uh, in the um, 1700s and 1800s, the master would have to provide housing for the apprentice. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily very uh, good. It depended on the, on the <laughs> master. <laughs> some might say that some apprentices were little more than slaves. <laughs> but uh, they did get um, fed and clothed and, uh, and so on. That, of course, uh, um, in the 19th century and so on, would probably not uh, be... Uh, the case, um, and certainly not in the 20th uh, century, they would uh, um, live at home. In fact, the engineering company that I uh, first started to work for um, when I went to, um, to work, it took on apprentices, and they were just like any other employee. They came in at whatever, upper state or uh, in the morning and went home at 6 o'clock at night. Um, so uh, they were no different from any other employee. Uh, so probably paid a lot less. Right. Now, are the records different? Um, are we actually finding more records earlier than later? I think that's probably true. The more modern ones, you do find some elderly people who are quite proud of having kept their apprenticeship uh, record. But um, I, probably most of them have just been thrown out with, you know, sort of old pay slips and that sort of thing. Nobody's much interested in them, you know, sort of. Uh, um, so uh, the survival rate has probably uh, gone, uh, gone down. No taxes on them. Little that helps you in terms of freedom of the city because that sort of thing has tended to, 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 uh, to die away. Although some of the city guilds obviously are still going very, uh, very strong. I don't know what percentage. It'd be interesting to find out what percentage... Uh, people are admitted to the City of London guilds as a result of serving an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. I suspect it's quite small. And didn't she mention that taxation ceased fairly early in the 19th century? They, obviously, when the government's involved and they're taxing, then there's more records. Yes, that's certainly true. Uh, the period on which there was definitely a tax on apprenticeship indentures was 1710 to 1811. Quite early, okay. Yeah. The Act was then repealed and there was, as far as I'm aware, no... Uh, no further taxation on it. But yes, as you say, once government gets involved, and when money and taxation are involved, that's when records get created, and hopefully a percentage of them get kept and survive, and, and, survive and, and help us with our genealogical research. Exactly. And I'm, I'm wondering, because I'm always so interested in how the people involved, you know, we look at the records all day long, but what were the people going through and thinking about? And, and the more I think about it, um, as I was looking through some census records in England, so many people, just agricultural laborers, it must have actually been quite a good deal to be able to, to secure an apprenticeship. I mean, it sounds quite harsh, and it sounds like many, you know, seven years and little pay and that type of thing. But actually, as I, as I look at um, the, the Cook family that I've been researching, it really meant a raising of their standard of living and their position in their town. I think that's, that's certainly true. Uh, you could have a, quite a harsh time, depending on your master, obviously, uh, when you were actually serving your apprenticeship. But once you'd uh, uh, become, uh, ser served your apprenticeship, you'd become a journeyman. Um, you could ply your trade wherever you, uh, you wished. Uh, you had stepped up a notch in society, and your earning potential was was greater, and uh, um, you and your family in due course were better off as a, as a result. Right, and, and you mentioned something. Somebody had a question during your presentation about would somebody who was in agricultural labor, a family, that that's what they did, would they typically then apprentice a son? And you said, oh, it sounded to me like the answer was more that, you know, those who were in trade tended to be able to then move their children on into trade. And, and I was thinking about it, and indeed, the one that I have that went into a blacksmith, uh, I remember now that his father, though I don't have any kind of apprentice records, um, was a very accomplished woodworker, yes. I guess I should say, uh, a carpenter. Yep. Um, so am I, am I understanding that right from what you were saying in terms of, who, what types of families would then put their children into apprenticeship? 
Yes, I think that's that's, that's pretty fair. Tradespeople would tend to put their uh, their children into a, uh, apprenticeship quite often with with relatives or uh, business um, colleagues, acquaintances, and whatever. Um, agricultural labourers, unlikely, they would effectively be put out to the field to just to work and earn some money, and uh, that was it. But there's one exception, really, to that, is if they were so poor that the children had to be taken into the workhouse, then there was always the possibility that the parish would then put them out uh, as an apprentice. Um, So uh, um, by being so poor, you may have actually... Improved your lot. (laughs) Improved your lot, definitely, yes. Um, And uh, you do get some quite strange thoughts in a way. Young girls, for instance, might well be put out as a servant uh, in the house of the, I can say the Lord, but the the top man in the the local village. And um, you sometimes see the expression of being apprenticed to housewifery. (laughs) <laughs> Whether there were any formal indentures or not, I don't know. Um, I suspect not. Um, and probably not too much training in that trade. They were just uh, through experience, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly, yes, yes, yeah. Um, I wonder how much, in fact, any of these trades, there were formal training um, in the sense that we think of it today. Uh, well, certainly not classroom-type training, I very much doubt um, they would just be following whatever their master happened to be happened to be doing, um, and they would. You, and you will see in some antique shops some apprentice pieces. They would be set, uh, for, for example, carpenters um, or joiners making furniture. You will sometimes see a small uh, cabinets and things like that, miniatures which are oh, yes. called apprentice pieces. Mm-hmm. And they were actually made by the apprentice to show that he had learnt either the whole trade or the aspect of the trade that his master was uh, concerned about. Almost like a, a salesman's sample. It was a miniature version of something, correct? That's right, exactly, yep. Interesting. Something that you mentioned that I just, the light bulb went on, very typical that somebody who had been apprenticed, who had learned a trade, ah, may indeed become a master. And there are then the potential of other records uh, later in their life to look for. Isn't that right? Yes, there are. Um, but don't get too excited in terms of actually the trade itself. These We're talking about small businesses here. And um, the master would be concerned about earning his, his living not about keeping records of things. Um, so, um, how many people would he employ? Well, difficult to say. It may be only two or three people. Or it may be a big corporation, a company, of course. Um, so, the chances of anything from that viewpoint aren't very high. But, when he comes to take apprentices on, as he would, um, uh, the name of master implies, then if there's a, a, a tax on them from 1710 to 1811, the name of the master is given there. So by going through those records, you can find out the names of the apprentices that the master took. If you find the apprenticeship indentures, and this is getting quite difficult because they tend not to be uh, indexed in that way, right. but um, uh, let's say Guild Records and Freedom of the City of London in particular, um, a lot of those records will name the master as well. Um, so, uh, yes, there are possibilities of finding out just a little bit more, uh, but it's starting to get rather more difficult. I imagine. Well, Chris, tell us a little bit about um, what you are doing these days and, and if listeners are interested in more information about um, the English apprentice records, um, where to find you and what other directions they might go. Uh, at the moment, I'm semi-retired. Um, my particular things that I'm doing at the moment really are uh, giving talks at, at conferences. Um, I'm speaking here in Philadelphia 
uh, at the FGS conference. I'm going on to uh, um, Ottawa in two weeks' time in Canada to speak at a three-day conference there. And I'm going to be speaking at uh, the Australasian uh, Federation Conference in Auckland and New Zealand in January 2009. So those keep me very busy. And I'm also um, working... Uh, well, my brother Michael is doing the hard work at the moment, revising one of our books, um, um, which I'm supposed to be reading pieces of, uh, um, uh, which is one of uh, uh, my ancestors in the British Army, and that comes out uh, in... Well, it's a, it's a revision of it, a major revision of it, and I hope it might be out by Christmas. Wonderful. So it sounds like, uh, boy, speaking at conferences like this, what a terrific way to spend a semi-retirement and seeing the world, it sounds like. <laughs> Definitely, yes, yes. That's uh, that's uh, one of my uh, one of my objectives. Is uh, while I'm still uh, young enough um, to see far away places, and uh, I've managed that so uh, so far. Well, thank you so much for um, spending a little bit of time with us, um, giving us some really good insight into some very specific types of records, but ones that I know that uh, people will be interested in. Enjoy the Amish country. I understand you'll be heading out that way after the conference. And uh, again, thank you so much. You're very welcome. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Rick Croom and Chris Watts in this episode dedicated to British research. Now, we've just touched on a few topics today, but I hope it inspires you to delve back into the branches of your family tree that make their way back to Britain. Now, before we go, I've got a couple more resources for you. Uh, first, I've recently published a two-part video interview with Fergal O'Donnell of the Roots Ireland website at rootsireland.ie. If you have Irish roots, you are definitely going to want to check these out. It's a two-parter uh, video interview because Fergal and I go in depth into Irish records, including naming conventions, uh, local identities, uh, the various churches that are involved, and how all of this is coming to your computer through the efforts of the Irish Family History Foundation. And there are a couple of good British history podcasts out there I wanted to remind you about. Uh, one of them is Binge Thinking History with Tony Cox. And of course, our friend James Mowat over at the History Zine podcast. Historyzine.com, a history magazine for your ears. Produced monthly or thereabouts. Containing history podcast reviews, containing linguistic history trivia bits, and focusing now and for the foreseeable future on the War of the Spanish Succession, a European war, 1701 to 1714, featuring Louis XIV of France, the Duke of Marlborough, Prince Eugene of Savoy, Leopold of Austria, and many others, slugging it out in the fields, mountains, and seas of Europe. Fighting for possessions, fighting for power, fighting for glory, fighting for trade. This is a fascinating time which sets the stage for the French Revolution, the British Empire, the rise of Prussia and the Age of Enlightenment. Come and listen to my podcasts at historyzine.com or search for Historyzine on iTunes. Hope you can join me there and bye for now. So I'll have links to the videos and the podcasts I just mentioned in the show notes for this episode 52. As always, uh, there's lots of ways to contact me. You can email me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com, or you can visit me on Facebook. I'd love to see you guys over there. And you can catch up on what's going on in the world of genealogy at my Genealogy Gems news blog. Just go to www.genealogygems.tv and click the blog button. And there you can also make your way uh, by clicking the podcast button to all the different various podcast episodes. So until next time, thanks so much for joining me, friend, and I'll talk to you soon.